Well, I, I, as I say in the morning, I will not do a presentation trying to show any modeling. I will talk only from the edge of the application of your models or the science you do, and where is the the problem and how we we see it, and trying to ask Mars some questions to provide answer or light to the dark moments in our firefighting life. I will use as an example the big fire of Chile last winter where we were, you can see the plume of that fire over the Pacific Ocean. It was more than 1,000 kilometers smoke getting into the Pacific Ocean. It was caused by a dry, high pressure system over the Andes, blah, blah, and you can see here how big he was that he was able to to move an entire low pressure system that was in the north coast of Chile. This is satellite picture of Chile and Argentina. That's the smoke, the plume, and you will see how the fire is actually breathing the fresh air of the low pressure system and eating it. So it's kind of full continental scale wildfire moving and and eating everything around. It was a huge fire. I was in charge that night of the fire. And it, it, it burned 114,000 hectares in one night, 8,000 hectares per hour. Something really, really big. And that's kind of the behavior Rothermel's model never provides. So the radiation model doesn't explain anything of that behavior, but that's the behavior we used to to work with, and that's not a big fire, that's initial attack, it's a small fire, it's the same fire when it starts, you can see how it's spotting everywhere and the spot fires, they run really fast to where we think the convection cell is sitting, so it's kind of, of what we call erratic fire behavior, and it's nothing, nothing to do about the classical model and this morning we've seen something that can help explain those things at least we are not saying we need a model to explain it but we need to understand that it's different ways to to explain it at the end that's a big big firestorm that was moving through the whole coast of chile so the central fire was there that was the central part of the storm the northern fires were turning around the main fire and the southern fire were turning around the other direction. So it was a big storm of 800 kilometers moving through a continental scale. So that traditionally we explain fires and level of energy. Traditionally, that's the way we've do, done that, assuming it's a radiation front with some convection. But this is changing a lot and, and, and the runs we've seen in the landscape, we're not able to be explain it but the, the traditional way of explain fire. But some of the things I want to ask Mark later on, those are the runs we can see in the landscape. That means the path of the fire has made some runs. We firefighters call that runs. And this morning he has shown how, how vorticity was creating those channels in the front of fire, and, and that's up the slope. So that's that has been seen in a lot of wildfires, and I think that when Mark explained this morning, that's my question, is that explaining those movements for us? That's what's happening. The fire is making peaks of flames and channels of low intensity and peaks of flame in the other side. And that's another type of example of crowning fires, but that's not in channels, that's in waves. I mean, that's how we saw the fire burning. So creating a big flame, then coming down crowning fire again, calming down, but every time the crowning was happening, the next wave was bigger. But it was happening on a regular path. It was a wave, stop, wave, stop, wave, stop. But the difference between that and that is it's just high intensity fire with a slope, create channels. Without a slope, they create waves. But then again, when the intensity or the energy release is a lot bigger, then you have the same runs, but not following a slope, just crossing the landscape without taking care of, of the topography. That's the extreme fire behavior, and that's the, 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 the really, really extreme firestorm. That's the knowledge, the, the fire behavior we are 
we are facing. And that's a fire behavior we we don't know how to how to un, to understand or, or to explain. Of course, we use a lot of the, the technology and the models we have available to run all types of simulations using Farsight or Wildfire Analyst or all other types or, of models. We run simulations, the simulations, they, we adjust them. They work very well trying, trying to, to adjust the rate of spread or, or time of arrival. So how much travel time the fire will spend from going to one place to another. So basically, all models using the traditional models at 50 years old are useful at the moment to make decisions about travel of the fire, so where the fire will be in a certain amount of time, but they don't explain anything about the behavior inside the front. So those runs, those, those vorticity cells, how that move, how what we can understand will be next when we see that that translation of heat through through the flame. So that's 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 what is really important for us because at the end what we are using is models that are spreading fire. You said this morning, a spread. It was the main focus of those models, not the physical fire behavior. But at the moment, the, let's say the spread is something that we can know. But but using those models, we simulate a spread where the fire will be, and then we try to simulate where the fire will go, which is the path of the fire. It is the minimum travel time mainly, and that's used to take decisions about where to put resources to fight fire, where to put management. But if the fire doesn't move using radiation models and move according to the new ideas, then this approach is not useful. But at the end, we as a firefighters, we use those models to decide where to put our firefighters. So, so then we use a lot of observations to adjust that. But the question is, what you said this morning, I'm sure you are working to improve that, but is the state of the art ready to be applied in explaining our firefighters how to how to understand fire behavior better and, and and try to be at the right place at the right moment because that's what we are trying to do at the moment. So actually we're using all technology of satellite to detect the hot spots and out of that automatically run the simulations and do all those type of calculations. But at the end, nothing explained those type of behavior I was I was showing. And I will show some videos to explain or to support. And out of that, I, ex I explain, I, I hope to discuss with you. That's an old fire, it's 2005 fire, but it still is one of the best fires we have filmed. That's the head of the fire. Of course, it's spinning and it's spotting a lot. And the, the cell that is inside, it's calling for the spots in there. It's pushing the spot outside, but it's calling the spots in there. And now we'll see the flank of the fire. And it's not exactly what you've seen in this video this morning, but we can see what we call our main run spinning up the hill. And behind, following the same flank, we have another cell. And far behind, behind we have the other cell. So this is more or less, it, it's for, traditionally in simulation, that will be a flank. But for us, that's not a flank. For us, that's the, what you call the engine of the fire. It's where all the runs come from. And it's like kind of vorticity growing from the back, going to the head. And of course, if we don't kill the fire and put the fire out there, we will never stop that fire. If we don't we put people on the front or try to fight that flanking. So, this is not a backing. This is where all the head fire is, is, is starting. So that's what we firefighters, we see when we go to fires. But it's not what science used to explain until now. And you are trying to explain those things. But at the end, all the models are made in models 50 years old, producing good spreads, models to show a spread of the fire, but not how fire behave exactly. That's a critical, the critical point. Another, another video about that. It's 
it was about all the well that's an old an old picture that we take back in 2009 when we visit Mark in Missoula he was starting to do some of the modeling it was showing how fire was connecting the fuel of course as you can see the head of the fire is up there but what is happening every time the fire does the flare up when it comes down at the bottom it contacts it, it's the contact of the flame that do the next one so at the end if we apply minimum travel time we will see that the head of the fire but at the end that's what is driving the fire so those things are the ones that worry as most what the implication of all this for fighting fires is really important. At the moment, it tells us that it is right. The reason why a lot of the modeling is not used in operational decision is because it's not predicting very well fire behavior. It's used in planning because it predicts spread. And the same, if we want to use modeling to, to, to do management to create resilient landscape, it's again the same problem. So as a firefighter in an open audience, I'm telling, that's how we see things. What do you think? 